Buen dia, good morning, boker tov, and good morning. So I want to take you back to about 1982. At that point, I had graduated with my Bachelor of Arts degree from Wayne State University about 11 years prior. I had a seven-year-old and a five-year-old, and I was really missing academic life. So I decided that I wanted to pursue one of my childhood dreams, which was to get a master's degree in Jewish studies. So I'm a Detroiter. Where do you go? Wayne State University, my alma mater. And there I was greeted by the head of the department, Dr. Jacob Lasner, who received me warmly, cordially, with great interest, and basically told me that there wasn't enough Jewish studies courses offered at Wayne for me to receive a master's degree. However, if I wanted to study, I was welcome to do so. So I uh, applied and was admitted into a graduate program at Wayne State University and had the great privilege and honor to study with Dr. Lasner. Well, it soon became apparent when I completed all the courses that were offered and still had most of the degree to pursue that I needed to go somewhere else. But I will never forget the warm welcome and um, the sensitive teaching that I was gifted to have received from Dr. Lasner. You can read in your booklet all about his wonderful achievements. Um, I will tell you that uh, Professor Lasner graduated with his PhD from Yale, that he specializes in medieval Near Eastern history with an emphasis on urban structures, political culture, and the background to Jewish-Muslim relations. Must be why we asked him to come here today. And that his newest book is Jews and the Muslim world, in the Arab, Jews and Muslims in the Arab world, haunted by past, real, and imagined. Now, I asked Dr. Lasner yesterday what he was looking forward most to this weekend, and he said, the Michigan-Illinois-Indiana game. <laughs> Illinois, I'm sorry, Michigan-Illinois game. You can tell where my heart is, right here. Anyways, so it reminded me how um, as academic as you are, how grounded you are in the real world, and that is always appreciated. So it is with great pleasure that I um, welcome to this podium Dr. Jacob Lasner discussing Islam then and now. Believe me, I can talk with a great deal more expertise about the Michigan-Illinois game than I can. <laughs> However, uh, you know, an invitation is an invitation. No. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Well, there, there's a minor problem, and, uh, which I'll explain to you. I just underwent uh, cataract surgery, and as a result, uh, have impaired vision which means I really have to uh, pour myself over these notes, so uh, I may speak louder and the microphone may be pushed aside uh, a little bit. I, I know this is a terrible thing because uh, one of the cardinal rules of public speaking is to make eye contact with the audience, but believe me, under the present circumstances, if I, if I stood back a bit, it wouldn't make any difference. I can't see the audience under any <laughs> circumstances. <laughs> So I can only respond to, uh, to uh, any noises that come out from this blurb that's uh, sitting in front of me. The real question will be whether I can see the notes that are sitting in front of me. Uh, maybe if I played with this a little bit. And... Is that OK? Yes. Ah, modern technology. Now, I, I hope no one will begrudge me if I uh, steal a few uh, moments from what is going to be a rather longish and pedantic uh, presentation to say a few words about uh, Sherwin Wine. Uh, I first met uh, Sherwin 44 years ago. He was a uh, youngish uh, rabbi of a very unconventional congregation, recently established. I was uh, a somewhat more youngish assistant professor at Wayne State University, and I had an invitation from the Hillel rabbi to attend a lecture by this Rabbi Sherwin Wine. Now, uh, being a good citizen and uh, Knowing that tenure came with being a big, good citizen, I decided that uh, it was in my best interest to go to all of these lectures, and I went. 
And uh, I can't say that Sherwin had a, uh, an enthusiastic audience uh, for his remarks. Uh, I will say, however, that what impressed me the most was that uh, he handled the audience with a sort of puckish uh, and gentle sense of humor that I don't have to relate to the people in this room. I mean, they know only too well to what I refer. I had an opportunity on certain occasions to speak to him about other matters, including the training of uh, future Reconstructionist rabbis, uh, excuse me, future uh, <laughs> humanistic rabbis. You see, uh, all heresies fall within one, uh, one general uh, box. It doesn't make much difference, but uh, uh, we, we, we had a discussion. It, it, it didn't come to all that much, uh, frankly, but again, it was a discussion that was conducted with the, the usual puckish uh, a sense of humor, but the, the one thing that I really respected Sherwin most for, and which oddly enough I didn't hear last night with all the, uh, the wonderful things that were said about him, was the, the great sense of compassion that he had as a human being and, and the wisdom which he conveyed to people who were in need of that wisdom and that compassion in times of crisis. He was uh, really an ideal kind of pastoral individual leaving all the philosophical questions aside. And I know this uh, because of uh, matters that happened within my own family. I have members of my family who are in Birmingham Temple. Uh, now, having said that, I, I think I have to begin speaking, and, and not about Michigan football, unfortunately. <laughs> I've been entrusted with the, uh, the task of speaking about Islam past and present, which I took to understand as meaning how Muslims, or in any case Muslim Arabs, the Muslims that I know best, have used venerable traditions from the formative period of Islam to influence their historical consciousness in contemporaneous ages. Now, this is a subject that has grabbed my attention for about 48 years, and so to distill all that I have on my mind in 48 minutes is a daunting test, to say the least, even for someone who speaks as rapidly as I do. So to spare you both the uh, physical and psychic agony of a rapid-fire survey that would be largely incomprehensible, I've decided uh, to focus on a shorter theme that I believe fits well with the presentations that will follow. I'm going to talk about concepts of tolerance among the early Muslims and suggest its possible residual effects in later times. Now, in Arab Muslim societies, where the bonds of tradition are ever so tightly wound, history has never been a subject whose importance reflects mere antiquarian interests or whose lessons are confined to formal instruction to board children in schoolrooms or to visits to shrines and museums. To the contrary, the past has served and continues to serve until this very day as a model that reaffirms and guides belief and stirs individuals and more inclusive groups to action. Among Muslims, the age of Muhammad and the Arab conquests that created a Muslim empire rivaling that of the Romans in size and in splendor, glorious and triumphal moments that took place more than 1,300 years ago, these remain deeply engraved on the consciousness of the Muslim faithful. Muslims declare the emergence of the Prophet and the formation of the Ummah, that is the early Islamic community, as nothing less than a major watershed in the history of humankind. A new era dawned when Muhammad, regarded by the Muslims as the last of a series of prophets sent by God, brought a message representing the quintessence of monotheist belief and practice. Although this latest expression of monotheism was meant to supersede the traditions of Jews and Christians, there is still much in the Prophet's message and in Muslim beliefs and rituals that was and still is familiar to the older faiths. Because in defining themselves, the Prophet and his followers embraced the spiritual outlook of the rightly guided biblical peoples and looked to their experiences for instruction, not only for Muslims of the time, but for Muslims in all generations to come. In such fashion, the accounts of the ancient Israelites reflecting stories that are familiar from the Bible and from Jewish and Christian tradition were woven into the broad fabric of Islamic experience. Jews and also Christians 
became, as a result, integral elements of a rich, universal Islamic history that reached back into ages long before the birth of Islam. Now, one might think at first glance, the Muslim embrace of the early history of monotheists and monotheism should have led to sympathy for Jews and Christians, that is to say, Muslims embrace, the Muslim embrace of the biblical past and of its prophets should have created a true mutual understanding, particularly with the Jews who were equally zealous about the unicity of the one and only God. There was no belief in Jesus' divinity to compromise the strict monotheism of Jews, the monotheism that they shared with the Muslims. Moreover, Jewish religious practice closely resembled that of the Muslims, especially as regards prayer, dietary restrictions, fasting, and laws of purity. And yet, there was and there continues to be a discord between the oldest and the youngest monotheists, between the Muslims and the Jews. With all that Judaism and Islam share in common, Muslims often found their most cherished traditions at odds with long-standing Jewish beliefs and practices. By holding firm to their own versions of the biblical past and to rituals and observances that had guided their daily lives over countless generations, Jews remaining loyal to Judaism signaled their rejection of Muhammad's mission. And so the Muslims asked, how could the Jews, and I might add also the Christians, reject Islam and its prophet if both the coming of Islam and its prophet were indeed foretold in the Hebrew Bible and other sacred Jewish texts as Muslims maintain? Such cheeky Jewish intransigence thus spoke to the negation by the Jews of their own authentic teachings while it challenged the very legitimacy of the Islamic faith. And so a common affection for the biblical past that might have led to mutual understanding between Jews and Muslims became instead an arena in which to contest sacred history. And that contest for sacred history has now been extended in the modern world into the modern political arena which we face today. The oral, as well as the written literature, I'm talking now about the traditional Islamic literature discussing Jews, is diverse and it is extensive. In addition to the Quran, the revealed scripture of the Muslims and the enormous body of commentary that accompanies the Quran, commentary to which the sacred text has given rise, there are references to Jews and Judaism and a wide range of historical and literary works, as well as folklore drawn from Muslim storytellers and popular preachers. There are also legal tracts and works of political theory that discuss the judicial status of the Jews in lands governed by Islam. Taken as a whole, the Muslim materials currently at hand, that is to say, the materials that could be read in printed works and that can be perused in as yet unedited manuscripts, form an extended tradition that would have to be judged by any objective standards as highly critical of Jews and their beliefs. And that raises a question. What explains the rather harsh tone of Islam's response to the Jews and Judaism, a response which in fact is much sharper than that reserved for the Christians of Islamic lands? Something seems to be askew here. After all, the Christians were far more numerous than the Jews, and they had potential allies throughout the formative years of Islamic civilization in the form of the neighboring Christian Byzantine Empire, a powerful imperial polity that engaged the Muslims in periodic warfare over 800 years, particularly along the frontier that separated the lands of Islam from the heartland of Eastern Christianity. And so why is it that the Jews, the most impotent of all the minorities in the Islamic world, were singled out for such disparaging comments? What could the Jews have done that merited the rebuke meted out to them by the Muslims in whose midst they dwelled. One would think that if the initial anti-Jewish sentiments that were rooted in the tribal politics of Arabia, namely the, the local Jews of Arabia's rejection of Muhammad and the fighting between Jews and Muslims at the time, that if these sentiments, we should think, should have disappeared, 
after the Muslims encountered the passive Jews of the lands colonized by the Muslims after the great Arab conquest of the seventh century, Jews who easily accommodated themselves to Muslim authority as they had previously accommodated themselves to Christian authority. With the passing decades and then centuries, the early traditions that were hostile towards Jews should have lost much, if not most, of their emotive force, particularly in the regions beyond Arabia. As these early anti-Jewish sentiments nevertheless continued, it's clear that the historical memory of the initial encounter between the Prophet and the Jews of Arabia was simply too firmly fixed in the historical consciousness of Muslims to lose any of its polemical thrust, not even in the vastly changed historical circumstances. If I can use a rather watery and fluffy metaphor, it was though the Muslim writers describing Jews and their religion collapsed time and rejected the notion that the passive Jews they now encountered were different from the fighting Jewish tribes of Arabia. So that wherever they might be, Jews continued to be blamed for rejecting the Prophet's mission, as did their co-religionists, the Jewish tribes of Arabia. And what is more, the Jews of the newly established Islamic provinces, places such as Egypt, Syria, Iraq, and the North African Maghreb, also had to bear the responsibility for those Medanese Jews who were accused of fighting the Prophet Muhammad or aligning themselves with Muhammad's enemies, be it directly or indirectly. How does one explain this curious and, for the Jews, very unwelcome mix of the past and the present? We have to be well aware that the broad case against the Jews was not confined to obscure documents written and fully intelligible only to learned Muslim authors. As the sharp anti-Jewish polemic was already embedded in Muslim scripture, the Muslim accusations against the Jews were designated to be timeless and in constant view, like the sacred text itself. A religious culture, like Judaism and indeed also Islam, a religious culture with a sacred book that has been revealed at a specific place and at a specific time requires that that text, if it is to be respected, be subjected to continuous interpretation. How else could God's word be applied to ever-changing conditions and to new and different environments. Every generation of Muslims read and or recited the Quran, combining past and contemporary commentary, thus elaborating on the acknowledged wisdom of previous Muslim readers. As a result, old anti-Jewish sentiments were constantly reviewed and made part of a more recent scholarly discussion, and this has continued throughout the generations. These sentiments also made their way into a broad range of Muslim writings that were, technically speaking, not part of the religious canon, histories and anecdotal accounts that came under the heading adab, an Arabic word roughly translated as belletre or general literature. Moreover, scholars were not the only consumers of anti-Jewish sentiments. The constant exposition of Muslim scripture became an integral part of popular teaching, preaching, and folklore, which filtered down in less technical language to the general populace. And so as a result, the earliest anti-Jewish sentiments, which were born of political conflict between the earliest Muslim community and the Jewish community of the time, and the religious rejection of God's quintessential messenger by that religious community events, which were events of the seventh century and in an Arabian environment, became indelibly etched in the historical consciousness of all Muslims, regardless of time and regardless of place. So when worthy of mention, the Jews were always described as Muslim writers and preachers made them out to be. Throughout the Middle Ages and beyond, they have been pictured as falsifiers of their own scripture, which, according to the Muslims, predicted the coming of Muhammad, and they have been predicted, uh, predictably uh, regarded as unreliable partners in commercial and political agreements, just as they allegedly had been in the lifetime of God's last messenger. 
In effect, Muhammad's rupture with the Jews of Arabia set the tone for all future Muslim attitudes towards Jews. From the very outset of the Prophet's campaigns in Arabia, the Islamic world had a well-stocked repertoire of anti-Jewish impressions, some of which stood out in bold relief. For example, in addition to all their moral failings and religious backsliding, the Jews were considered the descendants of pigs and monkeys, but not in the Darwinian sense of evolution. <laughs> Let me put it somewhat differently. The heart of Muhammad's encounter with the Jews, and indeed of all subsequent encounters between Jews and Muslims, was a battle for the ownership of the biblical past, a past that was embraced by both religious communities. Relying on the Quran, which in, many, in which many historic events and persons are shaped by narratives similar to, but often at variance with the Hebrew Bible and rabbinic lore, Muslims insisted on reworking Jewish and also Christian traditions while declaring them part of their own history and worldview. In sum, the Muslims challenged the core narratives that had demanded and continue to demand, and even among some Jews, continue to demand even today, the allegiance of those Jews remaining loyal to their faith. That brings us to the subject at hand, at least the subject that I want to discuss, and that is the question of notions of tolerance and coercion in medieval Islam with some references to medieval Europe. Sharply worded as they are, the negative comments employed by Muslims towards Jews and Judaism <clears throat> carry less theological baggage than the anti-Jewish polemics in medieval Europe. Unlike Christian tradition, which held Jews accountable for the death of Jesus, there was no Islamic account that linked the Jews in so dramatic a fashion to Muhammad, nor were there any Islamic rituals comparable to those of the Christians reenacting the events surrounding the trial of Jesus and the crucifixion. Now, to be sure, there are in fact Muslim traditions alleging that the Jews plotted the death of Muhammad. Some accounts maintain that he was actually poisoned by a Jewish woman. But Muslim tradition is on the whole skeptical of the veracity of these accounts. In any case, the alleged killing of Muhammad is not commemorated by Muslims and has been of relatively little importance in the actual conduct of Muslim-Jewish relations, a far cry, needless to say, from the Christian accusation that the Jews killed Jesus. When an American statesman uh, some 50 years ago was asked by a congressional committee on why there was such enmity between uh, the state of Israel and its Arab neighbors, his remark was that he believed that the Jews killed Muhammad. Now, this uh, raised a certain amount of nervous laughter in the Jewish community, but among people who knew something of Islamic history, we were willing to grant that he might have been informed at that particular moment of some of these Islamic traditions, which indeed uh, say that uh, Muhammad was in fact killed by the Jews, although uh, the poison was so subtle, he only died four years after ingesting the, uh, <laughs> this particular morsel. Uh, the fact of the matter is uh, that really looked at a little more, more carefully, one had the impression that the, uh, the tradition that he cited in which the Jews were culpable for the death of Muhammad, uh, when he cited that tradition, he might have been relying more likely on memories which he uh, retained from his own Christian upbringing rather than any Islamic tradition that he might have known. Uh, medieval Muslim authors uh, correctly recognized the Jews as having a long and venerable history in territories that composed the abode of Islam or that comprised the abode of Islam. The descendants of the ancient Israelites were not in the Islamic world regarded as despised interlopers as they often were considered in the Latin West. Rather, they shared in theory the same watan or homeland with their Muslim neighbors. Nor did medieval Muslims consider Jews living among them to be demonic creatures as in the lands of Christendom, they did not accuse the Jews of killing Jewish children so that they could use, uh, killing Muslim children so that they could use their innocent blood in baking matzahs for the Passover festival, nor for that matter did they accuse Jews of poisoning wells, a charge very often levied against Jews in the Christian West. 
the more recent Muslim representations of demonic Jews, representations which mirror the anti-Jewish and anti-Semitic canards of the Christian world, medieval as well as modern, are just that. They are oral, written, and artistic representations which are borrowed from Christians beginning in the 19th century. Aside from the early experiences in Arabia during Muhammad's ascent to power, there was little in the Jewish experience under medieval Islamic rule to compare with the likes of the periodic Jewish expulsions in Europe, let alone the riot and subsequent mass suicide of the Jews of York in 1190, and certainly not the horrible fate that befell the Jewish communities as the Crusaders marched across Europe en route to the Holy Land. Can we then say that on the whole, the Muslims treated the Jews with a greater sense of tolerance than did the Christians in the Middle Ages. And related to that, what did medieval Muslims mean when they spoke of tolerance as opposed to our notions of the same? Or put somewhat differently, is traditional Islam a religion of tolerance as regards the Jews, as many Muslims now claim? As of late, those people who live in the liberal democracies of the Western world as it were, a world in which religious faith has been buffeted by secularism, if not an outright denial of religious faith, the meaning of tolerance originally indicating the bearing of a burden or the capacity to endure a dangerous substance has been expanded to include putting up with actions, beliefs, or peoples one does not like or approve of, or even peoples and ideas one vehemently imposes. One may tolerate heretics, even when intolerant of the heresies they espouse. Put somewhat differently, tolerance has come to imply, over time, the recognition that others are fully entitled to the free expression of their own ideas and the right to practice their faith and or their politics in accordance with their beliefs, provided that such views and practices do not compromise the codes of behavior that are the declared moral bedrock of our own liberal society. More recently, those who claim liberal values see being tolerant as an attempt to avoid being judgmental of other cultures. Liberals of this sort are inclined to avoid, or more so, to condemn moral con condescension, except regarding the most egregious displays of uncivilized behavior. For example, as a matter of principle, one can accept various practices of courtship and marriage among different elements of our larger and all-embracing liberal culture, but one can hardly be expected to tolerate honor killings except it is normative in other societies. Or, to choose a more pertinent example, in societies such as ours, one tolerates, indeed at times one even encourages protests and demonstrations against established authority, but not <coughs> behavior which imperils the civilities that are perquisite to maintaining proper law and order, and uh, I use the word here, proper, with all due respect. The liberal ideal of tolerance is the mark of a society that has embraced a live and let live attitude, a view most recently based on a progressive vision of history, a vision in which different cultures seek to accommodate one another in an ever-shrinking world, as if the moral guidelines of this emerging world will be in harmony with its merging economic forces as a matter of course. From this perspective, the highly diverse world of the past will give way to some sort of an idealized global village in which people of varied backgrounds who appear uh, spread near and wide will be obliged to dwell as if they represent a single community bound by mutual interests leading to a more secure and better life for all. Whether our world is currently moving in that direction is best a contested point, and I, for one, would not like to have to make that argument. Suffice it to say, medieval Muslims, considering others in their midst, viewed the world through a rather different set of lenses when they spoke of tolerance. There is an old Arabic maxim, the fingers of the hand are not of equal length. 
Responsible scholars who are attuned to differences that are caused by time and place are likely to note that current definitions of tolerance are broadened considerably, or I should say broadened considerably, the semantic field of those Arabic terms employed by Muslims in pre-modern times when they speak of tolerance. Now, it may seem quaint that some scholars are still concerned with understanding classical Arabic, especially the technical vocabulary of the times, but I would maintain that if one wishes to truly understand how different cultures perceive of the world and perceive of one another at any given moment, it's best to determine what words used in common actually convey in the languages of those respective cultures. In classical as well as modern Arabic, tolerance is usually expressed by the word ihtimal, the preferred usage, or by samcha, or samaha, and tasamach. As in English and European languages, ihtimal, meaning tolerance, is the act of being able to bear a burden. For the medieval Arabic lexicographers, that is to say those great scholars who compile these massive Arabic-Arabic dictionaries of, of, of the Middle Ages, dictionaries which all Arabists uh, are required to use uh, even today, for these lexicographers, ihtimal included as well a capacity to absorb annoyance with someone's insulting or presumptuous behavior, and by extension, patience or forbearance with someone or something. By no means does ihtimal imply, as it does to modern Arabic speakers, embracing Western notions of tolerance, treating those with whom one profoundly disagrees, or the views they hold, especially the views of unbelievers and their beliefs, with proper respect that is without resorting to moral pronouncements about the party's concern while avoiding as a matter of good faith any condescending, insulting, or hurtful language. Medieval Muslims had absolute license, if not an obligation, to point out the errors of the unbelievers and did so with predictable regularity. So much for ihtimal equals tolerance. Samcha, the samoch and samacha, Classical Arabic words for tolerance take on a rather different route before becoming synonymous with Western notions of tolerance. Based on an Arabic root that conveys, gener conveys generosity, the semantic field of these classical Arabic words was extended to mean lightening the load of a legal obligation and acting in an easy and gentle manner. From there we come to modern Arabic forbearance and beyond that, to a sense of tolerance which is more closely linked to the Western sense of the word. Hence the expression, Islam is the tolerant religion, al-Islam al-Hanifiya Samaha. But, and it is a significant but, Samaha conveyed to early readers an altogether different concept. When medieval scholars referred to Islam as al-Hanifiya Samaha, now understood to be the tolerant religion, they meant Islam is the lenient, or if you prefer, the flexible religion, in Arabic, the din yusur, that is a religion which does not impose excessively arduous practices upon believers as distinct from the stringent demands that are placed upon Jews by their religious authorities. As regards leniency or flexibility in Islamic law, when they turn to some of the examples which are cited in this context, uh, one example, for example, uh, deals with the various rules concerning ritual washing, an act required of Muslims before they say their five daily prayers. Now, when Muslims travel in barren regions, as Bedouins often did, and water is not available, and prayers nevertheless must be said, then sand may be used to replace water. Similarly, when sickness enters into one's life or difficult travel conditions occur during a particularly important period of time, Muslims are allowed to postpone the month-long fast of Ramadan in which they are enjoined to abstain from eating and drinking between sunrise and sunset to the following month. Now one could multiply these examples of flexibility in Islamic law many times over. The point is, when describing Islam as a religion of samaha, that is to say a religion of tolerance, the interpretive fingers of the medieval and the modern hands are not of equal length. 
is understood by medieval Muslims, samatha, which we come to understand as tolerance in our sense of tolerance, did not signify the toleration of other religions, let alone sympathetic consideration of their beliefs, as if all communities, be they Muslim or non-Muslim, were meant to thrive in some free marketplace of ideas. The more restrictive notion of tolerance is very much alive in the Muslim world today, at least in the Islamic Arab Near East. Needless to say, uh, one would look with uh, great sympathy to those Muslims who are reinterpreting such classical Arabic words to be more in accordance with the kinds of notions of tolerance that seem to guide us or should be guiding us today in the Western world. Now, there are, to be sure, limitations to any analysis of interfaith relations that is rooted largely, if not exclusively, in texts which are written and read mostly by learned scholars. Uh, seeking to recover the view of medieval Muslims, Islamicists, who are grounded in Arabic sources, tend to focus on the materials of the Quran and its commentaries, on legal traditions, on early works of Islamic jurisprudence and legal theory. They sometimes leave open how Muslims actually reacted to others who dwelt in their midst. And so no doubt, some will argue that this treatment of tolerance and coercion in Islam, and which one can easily point to the limits of Islamic tolerance and beyond that to the various loopholes in Islamic law and tradition which allow for different forms of coercion, how this kind of understanding of medieval Islam based on, on a reading of the Islamic tradition itself reflects the theoretical concerns of religious scholars who are arguing the finer points of law rather than describe the actual conduct of daily relations with the different faith communities with which the Muslims came in contact. And so in limiting oneself to these written sources, a scholar may in fact mislead us into believing that in medieval times, certainly during the formative period of Islamic civilization, the climate towards religious minorities in the lands of Islam was less accommodating than it really was or might have been. <clears throat> now, doubtless, this approach, based on meticulously researched and judiciously investigated written text, may ruffle a few feathers, if not be considered by some uh, defenders of, uh, of Islam today as demeaning to their faith. That said, those Muslims who today speak in positive terms of Islam as a tolerant religion, and those Muslims who speak in derogative terms of uh, individuals who spend a lifetime reading classical Arabic texts and trying to understand Islamic civilization should be cautious when they affect a criticism of these Western scholars. Admittedly, medieval Muslim authorities wrote for an audience of truly learned scholars, but the sum and the substance of these medieval discussions, which so often expresses negative attitudes towards faiths other than Islam, was reproduced in more accessible literary texts and filtered down into the general populace through a widespread oral tradition and folklore. As previously noted, that tradition and folklore seemingly formed the conventional wisdom of the times towards Jews and Judaism. There is then ever so much that we can really learn about interfaith relations from technical written sources provided, and this is of course the, the big proviso, provided that we pose the kinds of questions that open rather than close scholarly debate. Above all, we're obliged to ask, what does the anti-Jewish bias so well-defined and so ubiquitous among the Muslims reveal about daily contacts and patterns of interfaith behavior in medieval times? Put somewhat differently, did the anti-Jewish bias expressed in literary texts and oral traditions adversely affect relations between Jews and Muslims? And if so, how was this adverse relationship perceived by both parties? For example, can we really speak of Muslim authorities coercing Jews to compromise their beliefs and time-honored practices? Put most dramatically, did Jews feel any significant pressure to abandon their faith, even though early on Islamic law offered them, and also Christians, the status of protective minorities. And so what I'm moving here now is from the concepts of tolerance to the possibilities of coercion. Now, broadly speaking, 
The Quran was understood to prohibit pressuring other faiths to convert when it states there is no coercion in religion, an injunction that remains binding on Muslims until this very day. As forced conversion was, in fact, extremely rare, it never was in the Middle Ages, nor was it uh, in more modern times, an overriding and continuous concern for Jews in Muslim lands. Interestingly enough, the Quranic pronouncement, there is no coercion in religion, was intended at first not for Jews and Christians, that is to say not for other monotheists who believed basically as the Muslims did in the one and only God, but for Muslims polytheist opponents at a time when the newly declared prophet was in no position to impose his faith on his idolatrous Meccan kinsmen. It was in effect a concession to the political realities of the moment and this is clearly acknowledged in all the Muslim commentaries to the Quran that deal with this passage. However, the revealed statement was subsequently applied to monotheists refusing to accept the legitimacy of the prophet's mission, namely to Jews and to Muslims, and that also is found in Quran commentary. Now there are other verses quoted by modern Muslim scholars to stress the inherent toleration of Islam and its lack of coercion, especially by Muslims who are addressing a Western world that is fearful of militant Islamic revival. For example, Quran 109, 1-6, the surah, a segment of Muslim scripture, which is titled, Al-Kafirun, the unbelievers. The text reads, Ya yuha al-Kafirun, O you unbelievers, I will not worship what you worship, nor will you worship what I worship nor do I worship what you worshipped in the past, nor do you worship what I will worship. And then, of course, comes the, the critical line, lakum dinukum walidini, you have your religion and I have mine. Now, these verses are currently cited by Muslims in the West to exemplify a live and let live attitude, which it is proclaimed Islam has always called for with regard to other religions. I mean, this appears in the Quran. We're not now talking about some sort of an invented uh, tradition in the 20th century. This is something that goes back to the very origins of the Islamic religion. Now, certainly taken at face value, a modern reader could easily conclude that Muslim scripture, at least in this segment, speaks to a kind of tolerance trumpeted by liberal forces in the democratic societies of the West. But, as in all cases, when you're anxious to know what a text really means, you have to do the detective work to see what it meant in the context of that particular moment. These verses have a medieval context, and they also have an extensive medieval and modern commentary that offers a rather different gloss or interpretation on what Quran 109, 1-6 meant at an earlier time and a different world, an interpretation which is still taught in traditional Muslim schools today. Now, Muslim and Western scholars alike are agreed that these verses were originally uttered at a very early stage of the Prophet Muhammad's career, a time when Muhammad felt it necessary to establish a safe space for himself in an environment that was anything but sympathetic to his religious views, namely the beginning of his mission in his native polytheist Mecca. Some medieval commentators, in fact, link this Quranic text with the so-called satanic verses, Quranic passages in which the prophet seems to extol the virtues of pagan goddesses, like uh, 109, 1 to 6. The satanic verses are seen, uh, at least by Western scholars, as an apparent attempt to establish a less hostile environment for himself and for Muhammad and his followers at the earliest and most problematic stage of his mission. And needless to say, all of these verses, particularly the favorable verses to the goddesses, troubled the Muslim commentators as they understood only too clearly that in these instances what was purported to be divine revelation and was considered divine revelation seemed to subvert in a very, very direct way and to compromise the belief in the one and only God as the verses were in fact spoken by Muhammad and therefore were thus God's word revealed to the prophet, 
Of that, there could be no doubt. They could not be removed from the holy text, but they could be subjected to interpretive, inventive strategies. The Muslim authorities maintained that the reference to the goddesses were indeed uttered by Muhammad, but only because Satan had clouded his mind, therefore the designation the satanic verses. All Muslims reading these seemingly incongruous lines were thus able to perceive the glowing reference to the goddesses did not accurately reflect Allah's true message delivered through Muhammad his prophet, but rather the meddling of Satan. Now the unbelievers, also a rather problematic revelation, as it seems to be conciliatory to uh, those who did not believe in the unicity of God, namely to the idol worshipers of Mecca, this also caused difficulty. Uh, this also compromised uh, the very nature of, of Muhammad's message. And uh, it also created a, a difficult problem with regard to the Jews who were later included as being uh, part of the message of al Kafirun. Now, one could argue that this was a conciliatory statement uh, that was made on behalf of, uh, of the Prophet Muhammad because he was in a difficult position with regard to his idolatrous uh, uh, kinsmen in, in Mecca at the time. But the Jews, after all, they, they believed in the one and only God, so they really should have nothing to do with this particular statement altogether. Now, uh, the Muslims therefore had a, a different argument to argue here, and so they argued that this uh, seemingly conciliatory statement, whether if you want to regard it as conciliatory to the idolaters or conciliatory to the Jews, that this seemingly conciliatory statement is in fact an authentic revelation, but it is a revelation which was abrogated by the prophet's later utterances, any number of verses, that directly or indirectly command Muslims to turn and give battle against the unbelieving polytheists and others which are negative against the Jews. Now, the hermeneutic or the interpretive principle in which the message of these utterances uh, was abrogated is known in Arabic as Nasikh Mansukh. There is a, a principle that the, that the later verses of the Quran can abrogate the earlier verses of the Quran in such fashion, uh, for example, uh, the early prohibition uh, against praying while intoxicated was later extended to a total prohibition of imbibing stimulants. So we're obliged to ask, how might applying the principle of Nasikh Mansukh, that is the principle of abrogation, to the unbelievers, particularly to the verse, Lakum dinukum walidini, you have your religion and I have my religion, have affected, if at all, subsequent Muslim attitudes and behavior towards the Jews? Now, the Jews may have denied the prophet's legitimacy, and rejected his mission, which they did, but as did the Muslims, they did believe in the one true God. In that sense, the original verses of the unbelievers could hardly have referred to them in the same way that it spoke of the idol-worshipping Meccans. And once again, we find the Muslim commentators showing their interpretive dexterity. And so they argued, well, it's true that these conciliatory verses originally signified the polytheists who would not accept monotheism. The unbelievers were then later understood to include the blameworthy Jews of ancient times, in other words, those Jews who rejected their own prophets and, as the Muslim put it, killed them and their descendants. Therefore, they were the Jews of ancient times who rejected Moses, rejected the prophets of ancient Israel, and who could be linked to the Jews of the prophet Muhammad's time and to his mission. So however Muslims wish to interpret, you have your religion and I have mine, these verses hardly signified to medieval Muslims nor to traditional modern Muslims a blanket acceptance of others and their religious views and behavior, certainly not of the ancient Israelites who deliberately turned against their own tradition, which predicted Muhammad's future coming, and to those contemporaneous Jews who continue to reject Muhammad. Now, when it came to finding ammunition to use against the, the ancient Israelites, uh, the Muslims had no problems at all. All they had to do was turn to Hebrew scripture in Arabic translation. There's enough evidence there uh, because self-condemnation and self-criticism has been a 
a Jewish trait, an almost unique trait. Some of you may believe Woody Allen's mother invented this, but uh, that really is not the case. Uh, there is no figure in the entire Hebrew Bible who was treated uh, with, uh, with uh, absolute uh, magnanimity. I mean, uh, if you, King David, the greatest king in the entire history of Israel, uh, is, is a person who is accused of all sorts of, uh, of terrible deeds in, uh, in, in the Hebrew Bible, which has led even one Bible scholar to call him a, seri a serial killer. Uh, but, uh, not, not, not a statement to be taken overly seriously, I might add. Uh, Solomon, the world's wisest man, wasn't smart enough to, uh, to keep out of trouble when it came to women. And, uh, and even Moses, uh, who is the greatest figure in all of, uh, of Judaism, uh, uh, made the mistake of, uh, of doing something to a rock and uh, was not permitted to enter into the Holy Land. Now, you, no such comparable literature, by the way, exists in Islam. I mean, you will never find in all of Islamic tradition a single statement which compromises the Prophet Muhammad and in Shiite literature a statement which compromises Ali ibn Abi Talib, who is the, uh, the forerunner of, uh, of the Shiite Imams. So the question is then, how did the recalcitrant descendants of the biblical Israelites adjust to the realities of daily life within the abode of medieval Islam. Above all, we have to be totally aware that the forms of government that are all too familiar to us and related to that, the more modern notion of citizenship did not apply to the Islamic world of the times. As Fawaz so ably spoke of uh, last evening, today, whether in Europe or the Near East, the governing structure of all regimes is the nation state. In the modern Arab world, such states are usually expressed by the term ummah, the word originally understood by Muslims to mean a religious community, and by watan, a borrowing from classical Arabic where the word generally denotes native abode, usually in a geographically restricted sense, such as a tribal area to be defended in battle, or the neighborhood of a city and town. The very notion of a political state defined by geographical borders and a citizen reunited by national identity and thus given to some common purpose has no roots at all in the pre-modern Near East and more important, it has no foundation in traditional Islamic culture. In the Near East, the nascent state is the invention of the 19th century inspired by the European experience with nation building. In fact, there was no word in Arabic to describe the very concept of the state until some 250 years after the rise of Islam in the second century. Although for all intents and purposes, the polity that ruled the abode of Islam functioned in so many respects as does a state early on the Muslim ruling authority, had the official recognition of its constituents and its enemies, it controlled areas of territory, it administered justice through its appointed judiciary, it collected taxes, it protected shifting borders, it had professional armies, and so forth and so on. In other words, there was, in effect, the existence of a state, although there was no articulation of the notion of the state, but to the extent that one thinks of a state today, one does not find that in the medieval Islamic world. At no point in the Middle Ages, or indeed before the 19th century, could a Muslim ruling authority be defined as a country with an identifiable citizenry as one speaks today of France and the French, or German and the Germans, or America and the Americans. Indeed, the term for citizen in Arabic, muwatin, is a creation of the 20th century. Now, there are medieval words in Arabic to denote associations and groups, but none of these words convey the sense of rights and responsibilities that go along with citizenship in modern democratic nation states. The ideological cement that held the pre-modern Islamic societies together was loyalty compelled by the Islamic religion, or to be more precise, loyalty to embrace Muslim ideas and practices. In that theoretical sense, all Muslims belong to the sum of all Muslim societies, the Ummah or the universal community of Islam. Now, where does that leave the Jews? If there is no nation state or concept of citizenship in the pre-modern world, what was the status of Jews and other non-Muslims who dwelt in the lands of Islam? Keep in mind 
that the native population initially outnumbered the Muslim converts many times over, and that the disparity of numbers held true for centuries after the onset of Muslim rule. If one includes the massive communities of Christians who still fell, held their faith in the early Middle Ages, we're not speaking here of a small non-Muslim minority as we do today when the Muslims of the Arab states, Turkey and Iran represent something like 97% of the total population of those countries. It took centuries before the ongoing process of conversion to Islam shifted the demographic balance in favor of the Muslims. Those Arabs who emerged from the Arabian Peninsula to conquer the vast territories beyond, together with the early converts who joined the Arabian Muslims to form the expanding Islamic community. As most of the peoples did not initially convert to the new faith en masse, be they Jews or Christians or Zoroastrians and the like, the Muslims needed a formula to govern the indigenous population that capitulated to Islamic rule. Finding a precedent in the Quran, where else? The Muslims declared those among the conquered peoples who had a revealed scripture to be ahl dhimma, that's dhimmis, that is a protected minority. In return for obeying Muslim authorities, Jews and Christians alike were permitted to retain their property, to control their internal affairs of their own communities. They were allowed to retain their basic religious beliefs as they wished, while at the same time they were protected from physical harm. Most important, there was no danger of being coerced into converting to Islam. For Jews, this last provision was a welcome relief from the dangers they experienced in Christian Byzantine times and were soon to experience in Christian Europe. And all of those guarantees were guaranteed by Islamic law. There was, however, a reverse side to the seeming expression of tolerance. Uh, Jews, as did Christians, were slated to suffer from discriminatory Muslim legislation that imposed very heavy taxes upon them. They were denied the opportunity to serve in the military. They were forced to wear distinctive clothing that marked them as Jews, and in the case of the Christians, as believers in Christ. They could not call attention to their religious services in public. They were forced to wear distinctive clothing that marked them as Jews, again, and as Christians. I think I mentioned that before. They could not erect new synagogues, nor could Christians build new churches. And more generally, they had to be conscious of not offending Muslim sensibilities in any way. These regulations were subsumed in what has come to be known as the Covenant of Omar, so named because it was allegedly the Caliph Omar ibn al-Khattab, in the seventh century, who formulated this legislation. Now, in truth, the history of these legislative ordinances is more extended and complex. The anti-Jewish edicts that we find in Islamic law are really vestiges of earlier anti-Jewish Byzantine and Sasanian legislation. They were rarely invoked, and when they were invoked, they were seldom applied with rigor. Now, they were, to be sure, individual occasions when medieval Jewish communities in the lands of Islam were put under uh, serious uh, stress, but these were by and large exceptional circumstances. So given the disparity between the legal ordinances in the execution of the law, the question then is what can we say about Jewry in the Islamic realm? Happily, I'll leave that to Jane Gerber to discuss. Thank you.